Hello, everyone, and welcome to the snow day edition of the Monday check-in. Today is Monday, January 25th. I almost said July 25th. That would not have been accurate. And even less accurate since you just called it the snow day Monday check-in. Yeah, but maybe I was using snow day in like the metaphorical sense. Oh, no, I it's wasn't. literal. I'm, I'm looking out my window. It's, <laughs> it's quite literal today. <laughs> In fact, uh, for those uh, who are listening, uh, well, y'all know probably that we did close the church offices today, um, primarily because of the timing of this storm, that it started around midnight and uh, that it's supposed to be heaviest in the middle of the day today. And so uh, church offices closed, which means we're working remotely, including Damon and I, including uh, Gene, our office administrator. Uh, so yeah, here we are on the snow day edition of the Monday check-in. Yeah. yeah, so it's a snow day, but we're still doing stuff. Indeed. Yeah, like, you know, <laughs> I was working on a bulletin before we started doing this, so. Yeah, I have the same thing to do this afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. Uh, so for those that don't know the Monday check-in, uh, Greg and I, my name's Damon, by the way, one of the pastors at First Presbyterian Church, Hastings, Nebraska, 68901, joined by... Greg Allen Pickett, the other pastor at First Presbyterian Church in Hastings, Nebraska, also at the zip code 68901. That's right. And uh, so we get together, we have a little chat, uh, we take a little bit of a preview look at the scripture for the upcoming Sunday, and uh, we chat about that, have a little mini Bible study conversation. Then following that, we switch gears and we talk a little bit about life of the church, what's going on at First Pres, what folks should be aware of how folks can maybe hop in on things as well. So uh, we didn't decide who was going to do the opening prayer. How I'm do you want to? It? Okay, fair enough. I'll, uh, I'll open us up with a word of prayer. Okay. Let's pray. Gracious and loving God, as we sit inside the warmth of our houses watching the snow fall outside, we thank you. Uh, we thank you for shelter. We thank you for the beauty of your creation in the falling snow. We also ask you, Lord, to, to nudge us, encourage us, prod us, to think about those who may not be sitting in a warm house today. Remind us of our call as your followers to take care of the least of these in whatever way we are called to do that. Continue to bless and guide the work of First Presbyterian Church as we seek to do that, as we seek to be your hands and feet and shine your love and your light into our community, striving to take care of the least of these. This morning, as we study your holy word, may it enter our hearts and minds and inspire us to be your people, to be your servants. May it remind us of your love for us, but also our call to love one another, our neighbors and our strangers. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So for this upcoming Sunday, we have a little bit of scripture from Paul's letter to those gathered in Corinth at the eighth chapter, uh, verses one through 13. And Actually, the entire eighth chapter. All of the eighth chapter of Paul's first of the letters that remain uh, to those gathered in Corinth. Who knows how many he actually wrote to those gathered hey, in Corinth. There could be other ones out there. No. Yeah. We have two. two of them. Two of them made it into the canon. Two of yeah. them are considered part of our holy scripture. And yeah. so these are the two that we are going to spend some time <laughs> reading and focusing on. And today, particularly this first one at chapter eight. So mm -hmm. I <laughs> the rest of them got like mixed in with the bills or something and somebody threw them out when the, when the time <laughs> came out. We got lost behind the couch or something. I don't, we don't know where they went, but we have these two. Uh, the first of which is the one that we're going to read out of uh, Corinthians chapter eight. Now concerning food sacrificed to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Anyone who claims to know something does not yet have the necessary knowledge, but anyone who loves God is known by him. Hence, as to the eating of food offered to idols, 
we know that no idol in the world really exists and that there is no God but one. Indeed, even though there may, even though there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as in fact there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom all things and from whom are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. It is not everyone, however, who has this knowledge. Since some have become so accustomed to idols until now, they still think of the food they eat as food offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. Food will not bring us close to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat, and no better off if we do. But take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if others see you who possess knowledge eating, for if others see you who possess knowledge eating in the temple of an idol, they may not, since their conscience is weak, be encouraged to the point of eating food. Oh my gosh, I'm butchering verse 10. I'm going to start out. Verse 10. For if others see you who possess knowledge eating in the temple of an idol, might they not, since their conscience is weak, be encouraged to the point of eating food sacrificed to idols? So, by your knowledge, those weak believers for whom Christ died are destroyed. But when you thus sin against members of your family and wound their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food is a cause of their falling, I will never eat meat, so that I may not cause one of them to fall. And that's how that chapter goes, kind of. Greg, <laughs> I, I partly butchered it. I will admit to that. Also, that is not easy stuff to read. No, no, no. It, certainly it's, the Greek the Greek is complicated there. Uh, and, and the Greek translated into English, and particularly the NRSV, does not make it any less complicated. You get into this. Um, and it's also like, it's, it, it's like, it's like half thought on top of half thought and then like a, like full thought that you don't like that we don't necessarily really understand because Paul's assuming that his audience has all of this back cultural background information right <laughs> right that, that we don't necessarily understand uh, so which is a roundabout way of saying that we need this explained Greg what do you got yeah so uh, this is uh, obviously about uh, food sacrificed to idols in temples, which was a common practice in first century Palestine. And the question is whether or not uh, eating that food uh, somehow is a stumbling block to faith. And what Paul is trying to tell this Christian community is because we have been freed by Christ, as we studied in Galatians a few weeks ago, for freedom Christ has set us free. So we're not beholden to the laws of these temples about when and how we can eat this food that has been sacrificed to idols. And so what Paul has said, and, and he says it in other letters, go ahead and eat the food. It, it's, not, it's not an issue for your faith as a Christian. However, However, what he says here in chapter eight is if you eating that food becomes a stumbling block to somebody else being able to grow in their faith, then don't do it. Yeah, because we're, we're, in, we're in Corinth. We're talking about Gentile believers, right? And we're not talking about, we're talking about Roman temples, right? Yep. Uh, so we're talking about food sacrificed to, to Roman gods. Mm-hmm. Right. And and the thought being that if so, I, I'm I'm a I'm a Roman person walking around in Corinth and I see a Christian eating food sacrificed to Apollo. Was that one of them? Apollos. Yep. Right. Uh, I then I might think, oh, I, I can I can be a Christian and 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 but still pray to Apollos, right? Or um, to that sort of thing. And it would cause this sort of this confusion, 
yep. within them. And that's the stumbling, that that kind of a stumbling block, right? That we're talking yeah. about. They'll get the, yeah, they'll get I, the bad, they'll get the wrong idea about of what this faith is about, maybe. Exactly. Exactly. And so so Paul's like, hey, we've been freed of these ceremonial laws. And so we can eat whatever we want because we're not beholden to that anymore because Christ has made the sacrifice for us. We, we for freedom, Christ has set us free, right? But again, that Galatians passage, do not use your freedom for self-indulgence, or as Paul says here in uh, verse eight or verse nine, but take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. And so Paul is continuing to riff on this notion of Christian freedom, that the, the freedom we have in Christ is not freedom to do whatever we want whenever we want to. And one of the, the limitations to Christian freedom that Paul points out here in 1 Corinthians 8 is if, if we're practicing our freedom in a way that it is a stumbling block to others, don't do it. Knock it off. Right? Mm -hmm. And so Paul yeah. says, I will never eat meat if by my eating meat it causes somebody else to fall. Now, that's a, those are fighting words in the state of Nebraska, right? The beef state. <laughs> but, um, but what Paul is saying is that if this becomes a challenge for someone else, don't do it. There's a, there's a Greek word for this um, that Paul uses. And uh, I haven't actually gone into 1 Corinthians 8 to, to see if it's actually used here. But the, the word is adiaphora. And this would be uh, things that are not essential to the faith that shouldn't divide us basically, right? Mm -hmm. And so Paul's like, sure, you're free to eat meat sacrificed to idols, but ultimately that's adiaphora, that shouldn't divide us. And so if it becomes a stumbling block to others, don't let it hang you up in your own faith. Give it up and, and move on to the next thing because ultimately love is what should be driving this and love for others. And if our behavior, even within the context of our Christian freedom, is seen as a stumbling block to others that's behavior that we don't need to be engaging in right yeah so uh another that's is that part of the in essentials unity in where's that come from uh is that, that just some denominational motto it's a denominational motto that's attributed to a quotation but uh yeah it's it's in essentials unity in and everything else i don't know compassion or something or something to that effect maybe yeah I, i'm gonna pull it up it's it's a good one <clears throat> in essentials right. unity in non-essentials liberty in all things charity mm -hmm. uh oh there it is in in latin as well oh well sure right <laughs> I could have done it in Latin. I was just, it was the English version of it that was tripping me up. It's a famous motto of Christian Irenics, but it's much later in origin, appeared in da, 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 da. Lutheran and German Reformed churches found a hearty welcome among moderate divines. And I think it's the, um, it's the Disciples of Christ denomination that sort of hangs their hat on that quotation, if mm -hmm. I'm not mistaken. That would make sense to me. Okay. Um, based on their their largely congregational polity and whatnot but but it's in essentials new unity in non-essentials what did i say compassion uh liberty i think liberty yeah. in, in non-essentials liberty and in all things charity and that's uh or compassion yeah i think that that's a uh, that's an important thing and, and it probably derived largely from what paul's talking about here in uh first corinthians chapter eight right yeah, that well, that Greek root word that you were talking about made me made me think of that. Um, Adiaphora. Yeah. yeah, and I think in general, this is this sort of an idea or sort of an issue is a thing that pops up a lot in churches and in in communities of faith, right? Um, because we want to do things well, like we want to live the faith well and, and in in a right way. Um, even even like basic things like church. Um, architecture, right? How should a church be laid out, right? And where where should the choir be? Uh, should they be at the front? Should they be facing the congregation? Uh, some churches, are, the choir is at the back in a balcony looking, you know. Uh, some churches are that straight 
hallway, other tutors are in the round. Um, and, and each of those architectural choices says something theologically, um, uh, but they're not, they're not like essential. There's no <laughs> passage where Jesus says, this is how, this is how a church should be laid out. Right. Um, there's nothing like that. I think also of a, I was a seminary intern at a church in Northfield. Um, and I, so I would go and I would do something, some sort of liturgy thing on a Sunday morning at church. And I wore like a nice pair of slacks, nice button up dress shirt. Um, and then like the next time that I was there, I, I, the pastor wanted to talk to me and he had gotten some feedback from someone who was bothered by the fact that I didn't wear a tie. Um, I was helping to lead worship and I didn't wear a tie. And, and, and so we talked about it and, and he said, like, you and I, it doesn't really matter if you wear a tie or not to, to lead a worship service. Right. Um, but if it's going to bother people and it doesn't really bother you to wear a tie, then maybe just wear a tie <laughs> next time. And so, so the rest of the time that I was there, I wore a tie um, when I did things on Sunday morning, if I was leading the children's moment or reading scripture or whatever the case. Um, and that was just kind of a, it doesn't matter to you really if you wear a tie or not, um, but you not wearing a tie may prevent this person from hearing what you're saying. Uh, from hearing the scripture or hearing your interpretation or or that sort of thing. So it doesn't really bother you to wear one, then wear one. <laughs> and, then, uh, and that was a very helpful conversation to think about. And then I think it's kind of an example of the sort of thing that we're talking about. Absolutely, yeah. And so one of the interesting features of Christianity um, is that it is one of the few world religions that is capable of adopting itself in other cultures very effectively. Um, many of the other large world religions are, are tied to a particular language or a particular culture or um, a particular geographic space. And Christianity is not. And so Christianity goes into a culture and is able to adopt some of the tenets of that culture to make it culturally appropriate for the context that it's in without losing its core identity as what Christianity is. Uh, but then that means that you're gonna get a clash of cultures when Christianity meets Christianity. And so your culture of being a kid who grew up in rural Iowa, uh, wearing slacks and a button down without a tie was an appropriate way to stand in front of a church and lead worship. Whereas in a wealthy suburb of Minneapolis, I'm assuming making assumptions about Richfield, uh, Northfield it's farther away it's like it's like an hour outside okay. of the Twin Cities but it's but it is it's a very um, well educated town there's two small private colleges this is St. Olaf and Carleton are in Northfield okay. uh, and um, so it, yeah the, the, the congregation had a, had a more formal feel to it and, and a more right. generally professional um, worshiping body Right. So, so in this sense, you have this clash of cultures of, of, of a kid from a small town in Iowa and a formal college town north of Minneapolis. Um, and and, and I, I've done a lot of mission uh, work, both uh, domestically and, and overseas. And I find the same thing happens uh, in those contexts as well. Like uh, almost every church that I've visited in Latin America uh, really, really doesn't think that gambling is good. They think it's antithetical to the gospel and they see cards as, as a tool of gambling. And so every time I lead a short-term mission trip to Latin America, um, I check in with our partners there and then I will tell my group, don't bring playing cards. Even if you're playing Go Fish or Gin Rummy, because uh, they will see you break out those playing cards and they will perceive that to be, uh, that that'll be something that will make it so that we can't connect as fellow servants of Christ. Yeah. And so for us, the playing cards are out of Afro. We can give up our playing cards for a week or two weeks as we travel abroad 
Um, but for our, our brothers and sisters in Latin America, that would be a stumbling block. And so what do we do? We give up the playing cards. It's okay. It's fine. Um, and and that, I think that's kind of what Paul's getting at here. Don't allow these cultural differences to get in the way of you being able to successfully proclaim the good news of the gospel. And so if you need to, to, to not eat... <laughs> not eat the meat sacrificed to idols, if you need to not bring your playing cards to Latin America, if you need to throw on a tie to lead worship in Northfield, Minnesota, um, you know, it's not a big deal. And so are you giving up some sense of individual liberty? Sure. I'm giving up my liberty to play cards when I go on a mission trip in Latin America. But in the context of Christian freedom, I am actually living out my Christian freedom because I am able to more successfully proclaim the good news of the gospel in that context, uh, which is what I'm called to do. Yeah. Yep. And the, the tricky bit about it is being able to sort of identify what are the essential things and what are the non-essential things. Um, and sometimes that's really easy, you know, I would mean, tie, Okay, probably not a probably not an essential thing. I don't know. Maybe it is, um, but sometimes that gets that does get trickier. Yep. Uh, and there and there are things that are that are more central to the faith. Um, and how do we sort out how central to the faith is this um, sort of thing? And then you end up with different denominations <laughs> and and all sorts of different stuff. But yeah. Yeah, although I, I I like returning to passages like these, and and I've I've enjoyed in that sense um, this notion of being able to do ecumenical work of working with other churches in the community. Sure, Methodists and Presbyterians on paper theologically have differences that are were broad enough that it allowed us to not be part of the same church, but we can refocus on that which unites us and we can find common ground on that and do ministry and mission together. Um, and the United Harvest is a phenomenal example of that, right? Because we have a team from the Berean church that comes on a regular basis. We have a team from the Nazarene church that comes on a regular basis. Uh, we have a team from the United Church of Christ that comes. Uh, and then we of course have First United Methodist and First Presbyterian church. Uh, we are far enough apart theologically that we're not going to worship together every Sunday. Uh, we, we, we have enough differences in belief on some of these Christian essentials that we're not going to become one congregation. But when it comes to proclaiming the good news of the gospel in word and deed, and in this case, that means feeding our hungry neighbors, we can set those things aside and focus on that which unites us. Um, and that's such a vital part of uh, our faith and something that, gosh, uh, I hope we can do more of. Uh, and I think we do a good job of it locally here in Hastings, but on a larger statewide level and a larger national level and even a larger global level, this is the kind of thing that uh, I pray for regularly. And uh, yeah, it's just, it's, it's interesting. Yeah. Uh, well, it seems like this will preach. Do you think this will preach? I think it will. I think it will. Um, yeah, and it's going to have to be a shorter sermon. I've, I've made the promise in a public forum with witnesses present that this will be a short service on Sunday because uh, we are holding our annual congregational meeting on Sunday as well. So I need to try to keep the sermon shorter and I will work on doing that. Uh, we'll keep the service shorter as well. We might even cut out a hymn uh, or something. We'll see. Uh, and uh, so that we can strive for um, being able to, to get to the business of uh, the congregational meeting, which, which I say business, but it is truly the ministry of the church. Um, so for those of you who are listening and are members of the church, uh, let's talk about that congregational meeting briefly. Uh, we're gonna do it remotely. So if you are tuning in to our Sunday morning worship service, uh, either via Facebook Live or via the radio, just stay on at the end of worship and we'll make this real clear during worship. Uh, and then we'll roll right into the congregational meeting. Um, we mailed packets home that included our annual report as well as a postcard to vote on the issues that will come before the four of the congregational meeting. 
please get those postcards in the mail and back to the church so that we have enough to constitute a quorum. We will also be emailing out a link uh, for you to vote if you cannot get your postcard back in time. Uh, we'll send that link out. So either vote by postcard, get the, and, and uh, hopefully those, we got ours yesterday or Saturday in the mail. Uh, if you find that you can't get that postcard back in time, we'll send the link out probably on Thursday, reminding people and vote that way so that we can uh, constitute a quorum. And then in addition, uh, we Presbyterians do believe that the Holy Spirit works through these congregational meetings and we need to room, leave room for the Holy Spirit. Uh, so there will be an option if people need to call in business on the floor of the meeting, uh, there'll be a phone number for people to be able to do that. Um, but only if there's something different than what is on the agenda, if we need to bring new business to the floor. Um, so otherwise you'll be able to just stay on as you normally do, so long as you get your postcards or your uh, email ballots in. Did I cover it all, Damon? I think so. We should probably say if folks, <clears throat> like if they feel they don't have time to get the postcard in the mail and back to us, they could just stop by and put it in the tithes box at, yes. the, at the church as well. So, or, or bring it into the church office. I mean, yep. Yeah, ring the yeah. doorbell and we'll let you in and, and we'll we'll collect those. So yes, if you're if you're concerned about mail getting there in time and you're out driving about, although not today in the snow, please. Uh, <laughs> put on um, your snowshoes if you're going out today. Yes. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's just gotta get back to us somehow. Indeed. So you got a St. Bernard, tie it to their collar, send him or her off to the church, whatever works for you. Yeah. The other uh, thing I want to update you on is uh, our session, which is the Leadership Council of the Church, did meet uh, last Thursday to discuss COVID-19 precautions. Um, and after about an hour long, very robust conversation, uh, made the decision we're going to continue to suspend our in-person worship and stick with stay-at-home worship. And uh, we're going to, we set a two-month timeline on that. We will take this back up again at our session meeting in March, unless, unless the risk dial for the South Heartland District Health Department drops back into the yellow. Right now we're in the orange or elevated risk of community spread. If it drops back into the yellow, then session will reconvene in a called meeting and uh, try to find a way to restart some form of in-person worship. But for right now, um, that's what Sunday morning worship will continue to be this remote uh, stay-at-home worship as we've been doing uh, now for the last 10 months. And uh, we invite you to continue to join us for that. Uh, certainly miss being able to gather in person, but are grateful for the cautious approach that session is taking uh, in order to help preserve the health and safety of our church members and our community, and really ultimately to uphold this value of life um, and, and try to preserve and protect the lives of, of our church members and our larger community to keep this disease from spreading. So. Mm -hmm. That's that. Uh, we did reopen the building though for outside groups as well as for committee groups of up to 15 uh, with the limits on that being face masks are required, social distancing, as well as uh, trying to keep those meetings to an hour or less. So uh, we will restart uh, some of our other groups that we're meeting in the building. Uh, and we're grateful for that because that is a direct result of the risk dial moving from the red to the orange and now we're just hopefully waiting that it will move from the orange to the yellow and we'll continue to move back into uh, some form of life normalcy, who knows, but uh, yeah. Who knows, so, but, uh, but I'm, I'm appreciative of the, of the, the thoroughgoing uh, that session is willing um, to take and, and the full conversations that the, they're willing willing to have um, on this. So, uh, as since we are continuing, well, not necessarily since we, um, but as we continue to suspend uh, in-person worship, we are fortunate to have Kylie Wenberg on staff and she continues to uh, produce these, uh, she calls them five for five opportunities. And these are opportunities for folks to engage in uh, prayer practice and deepen their faith at home or wherever they wherever they may be, um, even while we continue to not be able to gather for worship um, as we would really desire to do, and uh, so those are 
there's little videos of them uh, we put on YouTube. Folks can find those, um, track them down and engage in that. It's five minutes a day for five days of the week. A uh, way to introduce a, a new sort of prayer practice into, into your life while we continue to, to experience this divide. Um, uh, so those are available for folks. Also, I will, I will begin to mention Kylie and I have been working on a Lenten devotional guide, devotional booklet. We're not entirely sure of what to call it just yet. Um, and it's a little bit different than the guides that we've done the last last few Advent and, and Lenten seasons. Uh, the last few seasons, we've, we've just sort of given a, a booklet of prayers written by staff, written by members, uh, and asked folks to, to do a daily prayer. Uh, this guide is a little bit different in that each day in the guide really is set up to build on the day before it. And, and it does have a particular intent, uh, and it's meant to engage us around, I don't know if folks have noticed, there's a lot of division and there's a lot of fracture in the world. And, <clears throat> and we wanted to sort of create something that would help us how do we as people of faith move into more unifying directions? Uh, how do we step away from this sort of this rancor, this sort of division from, how do we step away from seeing others as our enemies when they really probably aren't our enemies? Um, and so the, the guide is really meant to sort of engage us in a series of reflection and prayer around this idea of, of helping to move us more and more in a, in a, in a direction of unity uh, based, on the, based on the calling of Christ, uh, that they may all be one, uh, taken from the Gospel of John. Um, so I mentioned that now uh, we'll get that printed and hopefully we'll just mail it to everyone, uh, a paper copy. We'll have um, digital copy available as well for folks uh, that we can just email. Also, but uh, I want to mention that now so that folks have an opportunity to sort of think about it. And Lent is coming. Uh, <laughs> Ash Wednesday is the 17th? 17th. 17th of February. It's like two weeks, two and a half weeks? Uh, three weeks. Three weeks. Okay. But it's coming. Uh, and so as folks sort of start to look forward to that season, as they start to think about what, what spiritual practice they may engage in to deepen their faith during that time, uh, Give folks an opportunity to start to think about what might it look like to to really to really engage, really commit to this sort of practice and and doing this sequential sort of devotional. Um, I I'm excited about it. I think it's I think it's going to be really good. Uh, it's, there's some thought provoking stuff in it, um, and I think it is a really good opportunity to sort of test out this. If we if we're searching, if we're searching for unity, how might we, how might we move in those sorts of directions? So, yeah. And I'm grateful for the work that you and Kylie have put into preparing this. And I'm also excited to, to engage with it. And, and that's part of our, our larger uh, overarching uh, Christian ed, which is a big part of what we do as first Presbyterian church. Uh, we believe as Presbyterians in, in engaging our hearts and our minds in our faith. And uh, I think our, our Christian ed reflects that. So we have a lot of great adult Christian ed opportunities where uh, we do forums on Sunday morning at 9.15. Those are conducted by Zoom. Do we have one scheduled for the Sunday, Damon? Uh, we do not. Forum is actually going to take a couple of week break. Uh, we had a really nice uh, forum series on, create, on spirituality and the arts to tie in with the sermon series that you've been doing during Epiphany. Um, recordings of those are on YouTube, so folks can find those. And we're going to take a couple little week break, and then we'll come back in Lent uh, when Dan Deffenbaugh is going to lead a series on the Isenheim altarpiece uh, and taking a look at some of the characters represented there uh, and using that as sort of a jumping off point to explore some more um, biblical characters. So, Excellent. Uh, we also have a, another adult ed class called Heirs of Parent, and they're working through a book uh, by Bob Goff uh, called Big Dreams. And so you don't have to have read the book to join them. Uh, that is a great little Sunday school class as well. In addition, we have a Tuesday noon Bible study conducted by Zoom, but also in person if you want to come down to the church. 
and a Wednesday book study uh, where they're studying the book of Revelation. Uh, so lots and lots of ways to engage your hearts and minds as an adult at First Presbyterian Church of Hastings, even in this time of, uh, of social distancing. Um, our Christian Ed for Kids uh, pre-K through fifth grade is still being done remotely. Uh, Steph Brader, our director of Christian Ed, produces a video every week. Sometimes she leads it, sometimes what some of the Sunday school teachers lead it. Uh, one that's targeted for pre-K through second graders and another one that's for third through fifth graders. Those are great videos. We also send packets home. And so we're still engaging the faith of our children uh, and encouraging parents to do that, our grandparents. Um, and I commend those videos to anyone. Steph's doing a great job uh, producing those videos. They, they turn out really, really well. Uh, our middle school and high school youth groups will be restarting here in the month of February in person on Wednesday nights. So keep uh, your eyes and ears out for that if that's something that you have a youth who's involved in. Um, anything else that we've missed, Damon? Those are the things that I that I can think of. All right. For, for, for a guy who doesn't like doing church announcements, you do a good job with the church announcements, Damon. <laughs> well, you know, if me not doing the church announcements is going to be a stumbling block to someone else, <laughs> then I will do the church announcements. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, thank you for that. Um, should we close with a word of prayer? Yeah, let's do. Do you mind if I offer that prayer? I'd love for you to lead that. Thank you. All right. Loving and gracious God, I thank you for, um, for the diversity of your people. Um, I thank you for all of the different perspectives, all of the different interpretations, all of the different questions and thoughts and stories and experiences that help us to gain a fuller and deeper understanding of your truth and of your word. As we move throughout our lives of faith, help us to continue to be able to discern between the essential and the inessential. Help us to be willing to continue to look upon one another with charity and compassion. Uh, help us as far as we are able, as much as it depends on us, to live peaceably with all. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. With all those things said and done, then, toodaloo.